Welcome to the Office Hours Podcast. This is TK Coleman and Isaac Morehouse. We're like the geek squad for your professional development. Got a job you're trying to get, a work-related issue you're trying to resolve, a project you're trying to complete, an obstacle that's holding you up? Well, you're in the right place. You bring the problem, we bring the nuts and bolts. This is where you get philosophical insight and actionable advice on how to take charge of your life and career. There we go. Yeah, baby. Las horas de oficina. What is that, man? Well, I think it's office hours, but I'm probably saying it wrong. You speak Spanish? Si. <laughs> no. <laughs> un poquito, un poquito. No, I do. When I'm in a Spanish-speaking country, it takes me like a couple days, and then I'm pretty good to go. Like, I'm real sloppy, and I make a lot of mistakes, but I can I can get what I need, get where I need to go, and, and carry on a basic conversation. Wait, but what I'm asking is, does this knowledge come from somewhere, or do you just need to be in a, in a country for two days, and you <laughs> pick up on one- there for two days. No, I, <laughs> I, uh, I took like several semesters of Spanish in college and it, it was like awful. I hated the classes. I didn't learn anything. But from about age 12 to 20 and then a few times thereafter, um, I went to a Spanish speaking country pretty much every summer for at least a couple weeks, if not longer. Um, and I just would, you know, little bit by bit pick it up and I always forget it almost immediately when I get home. And I like can't do it, but I get down there and it's like something just clicks. And uh, that context, dude, the context, the necessity, I'm an extrovert. I like to meet people um, and something about the challenge of practicing the language. It's like, it just comes up. We were in Ecuador for six weeks and uh, it was like, I was on my game, dude. I was feeling the flow. And then I come back. I mean, I'm sure I was just horribly botching it, but people gave me a lot of grace. And then I come back and People are like, oh, do you speak Spanish? And I'm like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I only remember two things from my high school Spanish class. I took two semesters. Uh, the first is, um, oof, que mal suerte. I remember we used to hear this guy say that on the tape they played. Oof. Yeah, I don't even know what suerte. that means. That, that means, oh, what bad luck. So I, I remember <laughs> that. So when oh, I watch it. mal suerte. Okay, yeah. Yeah, when I watch the basketball and LeBron hits a shot, I'm like, oof, que mal suerte. Uh, and then the other is Tomas. So all the kids had Spanish names. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but they had names like Katie, Jeffrey, and they had easy Spanish names. Mine was Tacoa, and uh, we couldn't find a Spanish name for me. So my teacher, Senora Crick, she gave me Tomas, um, which was for Thomas because it started with a T. It's like, you know, we got to get a black kid something. <laughs> yeah, what's funny is like <laughs> the idea of a Spanish name is so odd because if you go somewhere that's Spanish speaking, they'll just say your name as you say it and pronounce it. As you say. <laughs> like if somebody comes over here from Mexico and their name's Jose, we don't call them Joe, you know, <laughs> like or John. We call, you know, we call them Jose because um, that's their name. So yeah, I, I had in Spanish class, it was always Isak Mascasa instead of Morehouse, Mas Casa. And it's like, no, Morehouse is actually a proper noun. That's my name. In <laughs> Spanish, it's also Morehouse. So, I, knew, I knew this reminds me, by the way, I knew this guy who, was, who spoke Spanish and I think his dad was from Cuba. And uh, he would like, sp- grew up in the States. So he had no you know, accent of any kind, except when he said his name, his last name. Cause that's it was amazing. Nunez. So he'd be like, oh yeah, my name is Joshua Munez. <laughs> it's like Joshua was totally normal. But was, anyway, good stuff. Hey, let's jump in, man. We got some good questions. Yeah, man. So I, I, I want to talk with you for a minute to get your theory on something. So something I've been kind of writing about a lot and talking with people about in my coaching sessions lately is this whole concept of working out loud, not only doing cool projects at work or learning things on your own, but finding ways to document it, finding ways. When you said working out loud, I thought maybe you meant the way that my brother works, which is he's just very loud. If you're in the next office over and he's on the phone, you can feel the walls shaking. That's that's one way to work out loud. That's amazing. Yes. So working out loud is basically this idea of, of showcasing your work. And here's what's really interesting about this. The number one objection that I have experienced across the board about showing your work isn't, I don't get the point, 
I don't see the value of it. It's, I don't want people to think that I'm being vain or superficial by showcasing the work that I do with the business that I work for or some online course that I took. The reason this is really interesting to me is because when you take a look at what young people are already doing on the internet, they they post political views and make fun of people that voted for a different candidate than them with no sense of risk. They're not worried about an employer not hiring them for that. They post selfies of themselves at parties and things along those and lines. They post rants about some server at a restaurant, how angry they are. They post about how they're depressed or lonely or mad at a girl. It's almost like I'm really scared. TK, I don't want to post like, hey, I've been working on this cool sales spreadsheet and I figured out this really awesome way to do pivot tables faster. Really cool. Well, I don't want to seem like I'm bragging. It's almost like, but then they'll go and post like, hey, here's to those people who never call you back. Right. It's like, it's like, TK, I'm worried that people will think I enjoy my life. Um, (laughs) I want to make sure they think that I'm like angry and bitter and grumpy and that I'm always feeling down. I, I don't want people to, to think I'm some kind of optimist who does productive things and isn't upset all the time, you know? Yes. Yes. Okay. So people buy my arguments whenever I have time to make the case for all the career benefits the learning benefits that come from showing your work, they get the arguments, but why is it that people are only insecure, afraid, and self-conscious when it comes to sharing success stories or learning stories? You're asking me about like why that is? Yeah. I don't know. You, you have, you have to have a theory. You've got the question. Let me think about it while you talk. Cause I can make some stuff up, but it probably won't be very good. What do you think it is? All right. So my, my initial impression. <laughs> well, Isaac, I thought you'd never ask. The whole reason I asked the question is because I wanted to give my theory, but I thought I better pretend like I wanted to hear yours. I, I like see, secretly sent you a text message. It was like, okay, now kick it back to me. Kick it back. <laughs> <laughs> my initial impression is that society kind of puts a pressure on optimists that they don't put on people who seem to be stressed out. So here's an example of how I experienced this when I would work at restaurants. I would always smile and be happy and maintain a cheerful disposition. And I found out very quickly that whenever people needed help, they would immediately ask me because they would see that I was happy and in a good mood. And they would assume, well, he's doing well. I'm sure he's got free time. I'm sure he's got energy to help me out. But the people who look stressed out, the people that look like they were having a bad time, if you needed someone to do something urgent, you wouldn't ask those people because you kind of lower your expectations of them. No, no, no. He's too stressed out. I'm not going to ask him to run my food. I'm going to ask that guy over there that's smiling. So I think when you come off as being happy, things are going well, you enjoy your life, although people aspire to that, it puts this pressure on you because people think, oh, Well, you've got it easy. I demand high expectations of you. Whereas if you're down and you broadcast the things that are going rough, people are more like, hey, do you do you need anything? Are you okay? Why don't you take the day off? And so my first impression is that people don't want to broadcast success or positive experiences because they feel like it's going to put pressure on them. To, to, to sustain this high level of expectation. The second thing, and I'll be much more concise with this, is I think people identify with feeling weak and vulnerable and inadequate much more than they identify with feeling like they're growing and life is going well for them. And so the rewards are just much greater, socially speaking. If you share bad news, like, screw my life, life sucks, you'll get 100 likes, people will love you and give you a ton of attention. Whereas if you're like, man, I'm just feeling so blessed, you might get like five likes and people will start worrying about you. Like, what's up with this guy? I'm going to try like the reverse. You know, sometimes people will be like, just really down, having a bad day. Don't want to talk about it. Just need something to lift me up. And then everybody will be like, hey, man, you're the best. Anytime you need to talk, let me know. Hey, I appreciate our friendship. And it's like, yeah, okay, I got what I need. I wonder, I've never seen the opposite. Hey, man, I'm just crushing it today. I'm having such a good time. I feel like I need somebody to bring me down a couple notches. Like, say some <laughs> negative stuff to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I think there's there's a lot of things potentially going on. But, but one is that I think envy is the most pervasive, least talked about, and most pernicious sentiment and, 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 and reality in society. Mm. It's really, really powerful. 
this, this idea of envy and envy is not, I want what you have. Envy goes a step further. It's, I would rather you not have that thing because it would make me feel better. Like your happiness makes me less happy. That's a very dangerous place. It's a very dark place, but it's really common. I mean, we all face that. I mean, you can take a simple sort of silly low stakes analogy and be like, what, you know, what's a sports team that you hate, TK? A sports team that I hate, the, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Right. Are you less happy when Cleveland succeeds? Yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. So we've all felt that in sports. And there's sort of a, we sort of enter into that game. We don't like legitimately wish ill on the human beings playing for that team, but like this sort of, this team archetype and the tribalism, it's, it's somewhat innocent in, in sports most of the time. But that same feeling applies in so many areas and it's very dangerous and it's very pervasive and it's never called out. People don't treat envy as something to be ashamed of. You can go on and post something about how everything good happens to my neighbor and, you know, kind of revealing a little bit of disdain for their success and people will support you. It's not like pride or vanity or lying that people generally are like, make you feel ashamed for those sort of vices or feelings people don't really make you pay very much for envy. It's this sort of, but it's very, very dangerous. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. It's, it's sort of lurking in a way. If you're saying, man, I feel so like awesome. I just nailed this big thing and here's how I did it. I had this great blah, blah, blah. You're sort of documenting your work excitedly. It's not like you're going to accrue a bunch of negative emotion, but you know, in the back of your mind, you feel like this might make people not like you as much because you know that you yourself have sometimes felt like people who seem to be, whether it's sharing successes or just sharing things that are like something they accomplished, even if they're not doing it in an arrogant way, there's this little bit of envy that would be more comfortable if they were sharing a failure or a struggle. I mean, how often on like a podcast interview or something with somebody successful, Everybody wants to know, like, tell me about the times you failed. And there can be lessons in those, and those can be great. It can be a nice contrast to a simple success story. But there's also a part of us that's like, I want you intimidate me. I'm envious. I want to know that you're also screwed up because I can't feel comfortable otherwise. You're going to make me mad. You're going to make my day worse hearing about your success if you don't temper it with something that tells me that you're also messed up. And I think there's some elements of that in there that kind of holds us back. And I actually don't think it's as big as a deal as we think. I mean, if you come across arrogantly, um, then yeah, you might irritate people. But if you're just genuine, when you think about people who are genuine, they're not trying to posture, they're genuinely interested in what they do. And they're talking about it, they're documenting. I think of Chuck Grimmett, who we work with, like you go to his blog and whatever, and he's like, hey, I figured out how to build my own sous vide cooker. Here are all the steps that I used. Hey, I figured out this new trick for SEO. Let me show you how I did it. It never comes across braggadociously. He's just really interested in all these things and he shares openly about it. And it makes you want to be around him because he has an energy and a, and a positivity. So I think we fear that doing it will create this little envy thing and it will sort of make people like us less. But I think that fear is maybe less founded than we think. Yeah, I get so many great book recommendations, resource recommendations from sharing my work out loud from people who think of me all the time when they see something cool, like, Hey man, this seems like something you like. And they say that because of the stuff I share. Yeah. So, your reputation is your resume. I mean, if there's a great opportunity having to do with, um, you know, the nexus of theater and philosophy, uh, if no one knows that you're really into that because you've never shared any of the stuff you've read or thought about that, then you're not going to get that opportunity. You know, it doesn't matter what's on your resume. It's going to come through word of mouth and through your sort of brand and what you're, what you're broadcasting. Share your work. All right, man. Last week's preview question. Here it was. After finishing my apprenticeship, my employer is ready to bring me on full time. Yay. They've asked me to make a salary requirement. I have had, it, yay was actually part of the question and I had to be. I know, but you, you kind of like, you made it sound like, like a yay. It was just <laughs> lackluster. Continue, I, continue. I've been out of the theater game for, for a while now, man. <laughs> I'm rusty. I have absolutely no experience with this question. I don't know what else to say besides uh, I like all the money you can give me. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Aside from not knowing what number to throw out, I also don't know the etiquette and conventions around it. Any advice? Absolutely. That's a, that's a great thing to be asked, by the way. Hey, give me a salary requirement. I want to hire you. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, we talked a little bit in a previous episode about some tips about asking for a raise um, and, and there's a lot of similar stuff, but I would say first, if someone says, 
we want to bring you on for this role. Give me the salary requirements. You're just like, I have no idea. Get a little bit of a ballpark by looking at some, some comparables. Like see if you can find out any other people in sort of similar jobs with sort of similar work experience to give yourself a range. Not so much because you're like, I want to limit myself to this or I have to achieve this amount, but to kind of get an idea of what is probably in the head ballpark wise of the person you're going to be talking to so that you don't like really surprise them uh, either too low or too high. Because being really surprised and shocked by what somebody comes with, it's not so much that like it's going to hurt your chances of getting a good amount. It's more like they're going to start to wonder about your judgment and think that you're sort of weird and maybe there's something odd going on there. So just to get a range that's, that's sort of normal. Okay. And then know what you want, know what you want. Like, what would it take for you to be happy in this job? Like, what would it take for you to survive? And then what would it take for you to feel like, I'm glad I have this job. And if you think of an amount that you want, and then you imagine presenting that amount and then saying, nope, we'd rather not have you work here. And your choice was either don't work there, you know, or work for less. If, if you're not immediately saying, oh, well, I would not work here. I would never work there for less than that. Then, then if that's true, then that's a good amount. That, that's a true amount. But if you're like, ooh, well, no, it's not like I wouldn't work here. I just wish I could get that much. Then, then, then you're bluffing, right? You're saying an amount that's higher than what you actually would require to be happy in the job. Don't worry about nickeling and diming every single bit you can get. I mean, yeah, you want to get paid as much as you can get paid. But don't worry so much about that if you like the job the opportunities for more pay will absolutely continue to come. So be honest, give yourself, what's an amount that, you know, below this, I literally wouldn't work there. But at this amount, I would not only work there, but I would feel happy about it, right? So it's going to be some sort of range in there. And then I would say, take that and like add five grand to it and just say, okay, well, I'm going to add five grand to this. They may say no, they may go lower, they may say yes. And now I'm getting five grand above what I could happily accept to work here. Um, I think that's a a totally reasonable way to sort of go about it. And then in terms of the etiquette and conventions, don't even worry about that. I I don't really think there are that many in most roles. Like, you know, you see the movies where they like write down a number and flip it over and slide it across the table. (laughs) I I don't think you need to do any of that kind of stuff. You can send an email, you can go and talk, whatever makes you feel comfortable. But I think come in and say, okay, here's my salary requirement, you know, $35,000 $35,000 when really like you would stay if they said 30. If they said lower than 30, you might quit, but you'd stay if they said 30. And you know that like this job can be anywhere from 25 to 45 or something. So you're, you're in the range or whatever. 35K is what I would like to, to make for this role. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Like followed up, like I'm really eager. I'm excited. This is what I want about it. Woman. However you say it in person, in email, whatever works best for you. Um, you know, if they come back and say, well, we can't do that or let us look at our budget or whatever, no problem. Wait for them to make it some sort of counter. And if it's uh, within your range, just say yes. Don't go back and forth and haggle a whole bunch. Just just jump on it. That's what I would say. That's good stuff, man. I got nothing to add to that one. You nailed it. You You're nailed like, it. yeah, I never, I've never really thought about money. I just sort of <laughs> stay in the realm of ideas and food <laughs> ends up on my table. <laughs> You're like uh, Milton from from office space you haven't been receiving a paycheck or you haven't been on the payroll for like a year i I don't even know if i have a job i just wake up every morning do what i love and (laughs) i turn out all right (laughs) all right i'll read the next question i have two professional guests who agreed to be on my podcast one of them a professor the other one an author the conversations i had with both guests started out very well details were settled all that was left was for me to tell them when works no response I followed up after uh, two weeks or so. One of them didn't respond at all. The other said he'd get back to me in a couple days. It's now been another few weeks. I'm not sure how to react. Should I take the hint and back off? Should I keep respectfully following up? TK, how do you handle these situations? Number one, do not take it personally. Everyone's schedule is different. Everyone's personality is different. And no one is going to care about your project and think about it to the degree that you do. Um, we've all been through this. We've all experienced this. In fact, just just this past week, I had a guy reach out to me and ask for an introduction. Usually when I get an email, I'll respond within the same business day. I like to, uh, at the latest, respond within 24 hours, but I like to get, get to it within a couple hours. And 
it, it had been two hours without me replying. And he immediately sent the follow up like, hey, I hate to hound you. I just wanted to check in and, 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 and see if this was a, a possibility. And you could tell that this guy was thinking about his project very strongly. He needed an answer right then and there. But I didn't feel his urgency. I got back to him at that point. I knew the guy. But I didn't feel his sense of urgency. And it's very easy to assume that other people will have the same urgency as you. Don't read into it. Don't psychoanalyze. Don't take things personally. Practically, here's what works for me. I like to do what I, just, what I call permission-based follow-ups. Whenever I talk with a person, I get permission to follow up with them not by asking for it, but by telling them that I'm going to do it, telling them when I'm going to do it, and then proceeding to do it so long as they don't make an objection at the time that I'm telling them. So if we discuss something like you showing up on my podcast, I say, cool, I'll I'll shoot you an email this week and, and we'll get things sorted out. All right. So I shoot them an email and let's say they don't reply to me and it's been a couple of weeks. Then I will email them again and say, hey, just wanted to follow up on the podcast that we discussed. Um, you, know, uh, you know, let me know, blah, 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 blah. And then if they don't reply to that follow up, I'll, I'll do something like email them again and say, it looks like it's not a good time to do this right now. So I'm going to put this on the back burner and I'll circle back with you in another month or so. And, and this gives them the opportunity to come back and be like, oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. I'm so sorry. Completely forgot about it. We can totally do this now. Or they can come back and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I think that might be a better idea. Sorry, things have been crazy right now. And even if they don't come back and say anything, you've made it clear to them that you're going to be following up when you're going to be following up. And you don't have to do the mental work of wondering if you're being rude when it comes time to do it. I, I just executed this successfully over the course of a year, without eating up my time or losing my dignity with a professor that I really wanted to do a Praxis Group discussion. I wanted him to be the one to talk about this topic. And it took me about a year to book him. And I followed up with him a couple of times, you know, space between a couple of weeks. And on about three different occasions, I had to do that tactic of saying, looks like this isn't a good time. I'll, I'll circle back on this in a couple of months. Maybe things will be a little bit more convenient. After doing that several times, I finally got him. And from his vantage point, nothing was weird. He was like, yep, this is a good time. Let's do it. And I didn't analyze it. I didn't demand an explanation. Well, what happened all those other times? Why didn't you communicate? I took what I got. I wanted him. And since I built everything into my calendar system, I didn't waste any time chasing after him. Yeah, I mean, TK's method is great. And it's, it's typically pretty much what I do as well. The, the funny thing, the, the dead giveaway is that this is something you should expect is uh, you've got a professor and an author, <laughs> both, especially professors that I've found like notorious for being really bad at email management, um, kind of, you know, schedule stuff gets up in the air, don't follow up. So take the headache away from them as much as possible. So anytime you have that conversation where you get them on the phone or an email and they're like, yeah, this sounds great. I'd love to do it. Immediately translate that into an action item. Get the ball out of your court and immediately translate that into one simple thing they can do. Not like, okay, cool. Well, send me an outline of what you'd like to talk about. Give me some times you'd like to talk and let me know if you prefer Skype or email or, you know, Skype or Zoom or whatever. Like that's way too much. That's overload. Just immediately. Great. We're going to do this on Skype. What? Are Tuesdays and Thursdays best for you? Okay, great. I'll pick a Tuesday or Thursday, blah, 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 and then follow up with an email immediately. Please book one of the following times. I will send you final details beforehand. Um, you know, let me know if you have questions. And get it down to one quick immediate action item. Get that in front of them as soon as possible. And then if you want to be even more aggressive than TK's method, TK's method is really great. That's typically what I employ and it works well. But sometimes I'll go even more aggressive. If I don't hear back, I'll usually reply to the same thread first and say, hey, just bumping this back up to the top of your inbox in case you didn't see it. Let me know ASAP if one of these times works. Thanks. Okay, if that doesn't get responded to, then I will compose a new email separate from that thread that just says, you know, podcast interview details. Hey, I've, I'm ready to go with the details. Just need you to nail down the date. Here's a link to book it. Look forward to this. Thanks. Okay. If I still don't get that, I might say, Hey, haven't heard anything. Like TK said, I'm assuming this is a bad time. I'll just follow up with you every month or so until you book. <laughs> like if you want to get real aggressive and not just say, I'll follow up with you in the fall, you could be like, I'm just going to hit you up every so often <laughs> until we get it. You could decide what you feel comfortable with, but bottom line, 
um, yeah, keep following up. I mean, my basic thing is if I've got an ask in front of someone, especially if they have indicated that they are interested in that, I'm going to keep asking until I get a no. There's not really a reason to, and you don't have to be a jerk about it and be annoying, but always be polite. But, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just be dejected and stop. Don't stop. They talk to you. That means that they would like to do it. And they just have organizational issues on their end or prioritization issues that are different than yours. So keep coming at them. Sometimes it makes it easy. Sometimes I have people actually thank me. Thanks for keep for following up so many times. I kept forgetting, but I really wanted to do this. And it'll be like six emails deep. I've literally had that happen before. That's amazing. Hey, thanks for taking my money, man. I really wanted to invest in this. No, I mean, I generally, when I did fundraising, I would, I would sometimes do that. Follow up with somebody after a meeting or whatever. Here you go, blah, 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 blah. And then like nothing, nothing. I follow up again, nothing, nothing, follow up again. And then like the sixth time, they're like, hey, checks in the mail. Thanks for following up. I keep forgetting. Because like my thing is outside of their system of daily work. And so they never like integrated it into their calendar reminder or whatever they work. So the fact that I recognize it's not in your daily system, but you did indicate interest. So I'm going to keep making it easy for you because you might forget this week, but I'll bring it back up next week. It, it, it's amazing that often that doesn't bother people, really busy people with inbox management issues often are thankful for that. It reminds me of that biblical phrase, ask, seek, knock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's that neighbor who keeps asking for some bread in the middle of the night. And if you don't know the Bible verse, read it. I'm going to do you like Biggie Smalls. If you don't know, you better ask somebody. If you don't know, now you know. Oh, wait, no. Now you don't know. But you will if you go look it up. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, next question. I'm not satisfied with my job. Did you learn that pronunciation in your Spanish class too? <laughs> I, I knew you weren't going to let me get away with it. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, man. Okay. I'm not satisfied with my job. And I plan on leaving as soon as I find a better opportunity. This is secretly from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work with some coworker who's just a jerk. He interrupts me all the time. <laughs> I, I plan on leaving as soon as I find a better opportunity. Since I know I'm ready to move on, I was all set to inform them of my plans. But a friend advised me against it. She says I should never tell an employer I'm going to leave until I'm actually leaving. But isn't that unprofessional? What do you guys think? All right, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on this and TK, you can tell me if it's different. And, and again, circumstantially, these things can change and it depends on the nature. But I would say this, if you have already mentally checked out and you are going to kind of be slacking in your job, you're not going to be fully present. You're not going to be absolutely crushing it at the highest of your ability because you know you're leaving. Then I think you ought to tell them your exit plan and the timing. I'm going to be leaving. Here's my timetable. I'm going to be gone in three months. I'm looking for something right now, but I'm going to absolutely do my best in the meantime. Let me know what I can do. Be honest with them. And if they say, we want you out now, or if you know that your work is actually going to be really bad because you're going to be really distracted, then just put pressure on yourself and say, I'm leaving in two weeks, even if you don't have something else lined up. Because it's not fair to them, but it's not fair to yourself to ever be doing something where you're not doing it all the way. It's, it's going to hurt your reputation, but it's also going to hurt your reputation with yourself. You're going to start to internalize that this is acceptable. This is the kind of work that I do. It's going to hurt your confidence, your self-worth. So if you're, the fact that you know you're leaving is keeping you from crushing it, then tell them sooner and leave sooner. If not, if you can keep kicking ass and doing absolutely phenomenal work for them, in fact, if you know that you're leaving, it should give you added incentive to do even better work. And make it your goal so that when you tell them you're leaving, they beg you to stay. That they're like, oh, we're so sad to leave you. That should be the way you leave every job is that they don't want you to go. That's the ideal if you can make that possible. So kick ass, do a phenomenal job. If you can do that, then you don't need to tell them until you have something lined up. At which point, give them two weeks. That's the standard courtesy. Give them a two-week notice. I'm going to be gone in two weeks. You know, They may be mad and say, get out of here now. It's rare, but sometimes it happens. So be ready for that. But I've got this other thing lined up. It also makes telling them easier if they like you, especially because you don't just say I'm leaving. You say I'm leaving for this other opportunity that I couldn't say no to. And then they're like, okay, it's not just that you hate us. You know, you're leaving, whatever. Um, You know, I mean, if you want to tell them you hate them, you you have every right, but um, no need to, to burn bridges unnecessarily. So if you can keep kicking ass and focus, you can wait until you've got something lined up, give them two weeks. And then I would also tell you this do tons of transition work, not just continue to do your role until you leave, 
this is a great time to go through and document things that you've done in your role, document how you do your job, make changes to any procedures that you do differently so that the next person can come in and slide into that role, offer to train that next person, offer to go find and recruit them. Say, I've got three people in mind that I think could have my job. I had somebody come in and shadow me for a day and uh, they know how to do my job now. I'd recommend hiring them. Derek Sievers, um, the entrepreneur did a CD baby has this great little book called anything you want. And he talks about this, a, a job that he quit. He decided he was going to quit. He went out and found a buddy and said, come to work with me and shadow me for a day. I'm going to show you how to do my job. And he did. And then when he came to them, he said, Hey, I'm quitting, but I've already trained this guy to take over. That's an extreme version. Uh, your employer may or may not want something to that extent, but that basic idea is the way to think about it. And that's going to do wonders for you just who you are, your character, your self-worth, and that's how you work and your reputation. This is the kind of person who is looking to create value even when they're on their way out the door. I, I, I think that answer is so thorough. It's it's really difficult to add to it. But if anybody can, I'm that guy. I was going to say, <laughs> but I think I'm going to try. <laughs> that's like when someone comes up and says, and now for the man who needs no introduction, and then they proceed to give a lengthy introduction. <laughs> that might have been the best answer I've ever heard next to the one that I'm about to give. Not one single jot or tittle could be added to that answer however with that having been said <laughs> you know what I'll, I'll add this little tidbit i'll say think about the way you want to narrate your story to the next customer next client next employer that you want to trust you and leave in that way it's really easy to become so consumed with the next opportunity that you're only focused on what's the best way to get that next opportunity but how you leave your current opportunity is just as important as how you pursue the next one. And ask yourself, how do I want to tell this story? What way of telling this story feels right in my conscience? What way of telling this story is going to generate the trust that I want from people that have to work with me in the future? I identify perhaps way more than Isaac with leaving jobs because I didn't find them fulfilling. I had a lot of crazy, eccentric constantly changing artistic interests. And I was notorious in my 20s for getting really good jobs, making everyone around me proud. And then within a couple of weeks being like, I don't like this. But in every case, I thought about how do I want to tell this story? How do I want to narrate this when I'm done? Do I want to be the guy who, after working someplace for a couple of days, said, I don't like this and left? And in every case, when I decided I didn't like something, I would say, you know what, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit to this for six months just so I can give myself a fair opportunity to see what this experience is like, to see if anything changes. And I want to build social capital. I want to establish rapport. And then while I'm working here in this six months, I'm going to do the kind of work that makes them want to cry when they see me leave. And I'm going to try to figure out a way to make it as easy of a transition on them as possible. And in my cases, I actually did tell my employers when I was going to leave, but I never settled for the two-week notice. I always did more than that. I always made it a point to let them know when I was going to leave and let them know that I'll do whatever I need to do to stay on, help them find my replacement, help them make sure that replacement was up to par and better than me. And in every case, I backed that up. And, and that's a story that I'm proud to tell. And whenever people ask me, so why did you leave? I'm happy that they asked that question. I don't have to squirm because it's an opportunity to, to show my ability to create value. So that's all I'll add to it. Let well, me get, oh, go ahead. Where you're, at, where you're at in your role makes a big difference too. If you're in a role where the next month or several months is going to primarily involve them training you and you're not going to be creating a ton of value for them yet because you're still learning the ropes, then I would say it's, it's a better idea to, to tell them and to even exit sooner because they're mm -hmm. spending a ton of time training you and, and then to find out that you leave immediately after the training's done. If it's a role where you already know how to do your job, then it actually, they're not going to be look like you can tell them ahead of time, I'm leaving in three months and they're not likely to be like, get out of here now because they're going to want the extra time. Okay. You can keep doing your job for the time being, but you've given us plenty of lead time to find a replacement. They'll actually be thankful for that. But if it's, if it's something where like you're really new, you've just learned it, you're easily replaceable. If you give them a lot of lead time, they're more likely to be like, okay, go ahead and get out of there. And again, you got to decide <clears throat> whether that's right for you. Yeah, you definitely don't want people to feel used. 
Um, yep. All right. Preview question for the next episode. What's the best way to seek out finding potential companies uh, to work for in a given geographical area that isn't actively hiring? How do you identify business opportunities that aren't, quote unquote, in your network? For the next episode, yada, da, da, da. That's all I think about when you say da, next da, 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 da. We won't sing it though. It's just it's not safe for work. <laughs> <laughs> Office hours. It's been real. It's been real. All right. Later.